Jesus name let us pray dear mighty and gracious Heavenly Father you who have given us this day you who give us the air that we breathe and have created this whole universe you have given us the breath of life without you none of us are anything this morning, give us hearts that are thankful and gracious towards your mighty grace and your love in sending your son Jesus here for each of us. This congregation would like to thank you for the guests that you have allowed to come here. We would want to serve them, dear Father, as you would want them served. And we are so thankful that you would give us the opportunity to serve them and in so we are able to serve you. This morning when the brothers come here to speak, would you lay on them the message? You know what this little congregation needs. You know each one of us personally. And in our weakness, we don't even know, as you know, what we need. But we ask that today you would see fit that we receive and have hearts and give us hearts that would receive what we need. Give us a greater hope of that home that you have prepared. Let us see more clearly that way that you have made possible through your son and his precious blood on the cross. We pray for this nation of ours and the leaders of this nation that they would be given the wisdom and the ability to do what needs to be done for this country and turn them, turn them towards you and give us as your children faith to accept what happens. Hear us now as we pray that perfect prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Beloved, we come to the compassionate heart of the Father this morning in the name of Jesus Christ, his Son, our Redeemer and Savior. And we do ask that God's Spirit will witness to our hearts this morning of him who is our life, our salvation, our all in all. This morning, as we wait upon God to greet us from heaven above, I would want to give you greetings from God's children from the West Coast, where some of you are uh, from, from there, from your families, uh, your fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, loved ones. Also from New Hampshire, where many of you also have your families. And also, as we journeyed from New Hampshire here, we uh, spent a night in Pennsylvania with a Christian couple, also in Delaware, and also in Virginia. And as we look upon these greetings, the word of God often, and especially Paul in his epistles, speaks of great greetings of peace and love and grace. Sometimes it's almost felt as though the greeting has become a form, and some even feel it's just an old tradition. I remember one time, Martha and I, we were traveling. We stopped in North Dakota to visit a Christian couple who were all by themselves. We were the second visitors, Christian visitors they had had in seven years. I greeted the man with God's peace, and immediately he began to rejoice and thank God. Oh, how sweet is that greeting of God's peace, my beloved, when it's in our heart and we have become partakers of the preciousness of living Christianity. May it be that that greeting will be among us and with us in all the days of our pilgrimage and our life. I look upon this congregation this morning, the children, the young. Oh, may God instill in their hearts a living, living knowledge of Jesus Christ. And may the warm blood of Christ, which washes away our sins and trespasses, be upon their hearts as he tenderly leads them upon the way of life. The prophet has written, To this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. The prophet says, This is the man to whom God will look, the one who is poor, of a contrite spirit, and trembles at his word. David experienced in his time of need when he had fallen deeply, deeply into sin, that there was one thing that God would not reject, that is a broken and a contrite heart God will not despise. Beloved, living Christianity and the very first work of God in man's heart is to make man a sinner, make him a beggar of grace. And as a beggar of grace, then, man poor in spirit, and contrite of heart, he also faces the word of God, which is not only filled with mercy and grace, but is also altogether righteous. And as man stands in the presence of this righteousness of God, then man truly trembles, trembles before the word, he has to be a beggar of grace. Uh, in the year of... Uh, 1947, which is just 51 years ago, I was called to Detroit, Michigan for the first time to keep, keep services. When I came home from Detroit, I told my wife, Martha, that I've had an experience that I've never had before. A man came to me, a Christian man, and he examined my heart and the foundation of my Christianity. I was... Uh, a young man, 27 years old, uh, and I'm sure no one before had inquired of my heart as he inquired of my heart, what is the foundation of your Christianity? You know, that man became one of my dearest friends. I shared with him until the hour of his death. Uh, often together we spoke of our hearts. Often we stood before a righteous God and before a God who judges righteously. 
And in the end of his life, then he came to the place where he could no longer communicate. Uh, at first, uh, his hearing went, then finally his speech went, and we often communicated by writing, writing one to another. And the very last message I had from this man, I got a letter in the mail. And I opened the letter, and it was a piece of paper, and on it was typed, can I be a Christian? Can I be a Christian? I don't think it'll hurt this morning for me to say who the man was. It was Jeff Deacon's grandfather. A precious heart and soul mighty love. At the end of his journey, he had to cry, can I be a Christian? I mentioned as we journeyed from New Hampshire here, we stopped uh, to visit people. And as we stopped to visit those people, we can see how they are neglected and how often, because of this, they start to seek and to search for things. And as I left those homes, my heart condemned me. I'm so poor to care for others. I'm so slow to serve others. I always serve, serve myself rather than to serve others. And this morning of grace, in the words of Brother Vic Ketula, can I be a Christian? That's what I wonder this morning. Can I be a Christian with my faults, with my slowness to speak of Christianity? My care for hearts and souls is so lacking in everything. This morning I want to ask of you, is there grace and forgiveness for me? And I do want to believe, my beloved, there's no other hope, no other way to go. And beloved, for each one of your hearts this morning, for the youngest to the oldest, there is no refuge in under the stars of heaven, except in the bleeding wounds of the crucified, and in under his wings of grace, and there with the crimson stream of his blood flows, and flows yet for you and for me, beloved. This morning, I would want to read from Second Timothy, the first chapter, the first 14 verses, Second Timothy 1. And I read this morning in Jesus' name, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve for my forefathers with a pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers, night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. What is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost, 
which dwelleth in us. Amen. Beloved, uh, we live in a time of change, a time when it seems like there is restlessness in hearts and people are running hither and yon, seeking something. And many times as we look upon the things that are around us and surround us today, we almost forget that there is something that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The scripture speaks of Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I'm sure that every one of us say, yes, this is true, that Christ is the same today it's, as he was yesterday and will be forever. But for our own heart and soul to know that he is the same towards us now as he was when we took the first feeble step upon the way of life. Oh, how many times we love with a trembling heart, children of God, feel that my heart has wandered so far away and I've gone so far away from the Savior. Can it possibly be that I am any longer his child? But he is faithful and his heart of love is always the same. It's just as warm, just as fervent. Our hearts many times grow cold. Mine does. Many times you wonder, how cold can my heart be? But his heart is always just as fervent. And every beat of his heart is filled with compassion and love for the sinner. This morning of grace, we thank God for something that always remains, never changes. And as he is never changing, beloved, so likewise is his word. It is always just as steadfast, just as sure. Never does it change. His promises always are the same. They always remain just as they are. This morning, as we have heard from this part of God's word, the Apostle Paul is writing to his young brother, Timothy. And he is exhorting Timothy to look to the promises of God and those things that have been. And Paul, when he writes of this, he speaks of himself as the apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul himself witnesses that I am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. We look at Paul. We know his sins, his transgressions. We know that he was a great sinner, who was saved, saved by God's, God's grace alone. When Paul became a child of God, he could not be silent. He had to speak of that which God had done in his heart. And in the process of this, then young Timothy came in under the preaching of Paul. And as the scripture here tells us, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. When Paul writes this way of Timothy, Timothy was not his natural son. But if you will look in the first chapter of 1 Timothy, you will see that he is Paul's son after the faith. And God has always used then his children to bring the word and the message to the heart of man. And so it was that Paul brought the word to Timothy and between them there became a bond and this bond was a bond of love. And how could it be otherwise? When somebody is troubled in heart and conscience and the fires of hell are burning under his feet, he has no refuge and under the stars of heaven. If he would go to the uttermost parts of the sea, God's hand would be there. If he went to the depths of hell, there God would find him. And when that troubled, weary, sinful heart finds grace and peace through the gospel and the gospel that is preached. How can it be otherwise but its heart is united with that one who has preached and made known unto him the gospel? This fall, when we were in New Hampshire, when Arnold Corfinan from Finland was there, um, Corfinan's wife and daughter were with, and his daughter Isla, who wasn't in faith too many years because she spent about 20 years in unbelief. She related her experience of heart, and she said that when her time came to be born into God's kingdom, her grandmother was her spiritual midwife. And when she spoke of her grandmother, how could she speak of her grandmother other when with complete joy and delight in her heart and the sweet memory of her grandmother 
who was the one who helped her to come into God's kingdom of grace. And so it was between Timothy and Paul. And as we go on with this part of God's word, then in the fourth verse, uh, Paul says, Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. So Paul then, his heart delighted to be with Timothy. He delighted to speak with him together of Christianity and of what God had done in their hearts. And you know, in this pilgrimage then, weary hearts and souls, it's so good that there's somebody who you can speak to and talk to about your heart, your struggles, your trials, your tribulations, your sorrows, yes, your sins, beloved. And this is one of the confidences that we do have, we in the blessings of living Christianity, that we can speak our hearts, we can go to somebody when we are troubled and speak of all those things that trouble our innermost heart. And I've heard some people say that there's no one who cares about me, no one who I can speak to. And I have to say this must truly be a miserable thing. I have the experience, beloved, uh, of being old and getting near the end of my journey. I look back upon all the old travelers with whom I have shared my heart. Most of them are now, now gone. And I just have to thank God that even though my old friends, those who nurtured and cared for my heart when I was young, they have gone on to be with Jesus. But I'm thankful that there are still maybe even young, who I can share my heart with. And for all of you this morning, you know, this we do need. We need this care and this keeping in Christianity. And especially then, when somebody has first come into faith, how needful it is that there's care for their hearts and their souls. Just now when we were in New Hampshire, we went with Bernie and Hester Lamp and them to visit uh, Mrs. Ferguson, Jean Ferguson's mother. And uh, she has cancer, 85 years old. Her life is soon going to end. When we went there, she said that, I have something to confess, but I won't confess it. I'll wait until the last minute of my life before I reveal it. And she said, if I would reveal it, I know it's going to spread all around. I'm not going to speak about what it was at all, maybe love. But Bernie and Hester said that, well, how do you know that you will have the opportunity? And after a little while, she said, I'm going to speak about it right now, right now. So she poured out her heart, heart to us. We all proclaimed forgiveness, forgiveness to her. And then as you were leaving, she says, now oh, I can feel I'm a child of God. We, Fergie was leaving the following day for Alaska again. And he was there, not there at the time when Ted and Shirley Seppala, who were bringing Fergie to the airport, stopped there. Well, Fergie's mother poured out her heart and told everything that had happened to her heart. And we can say, this is so wonderful. But oh, that there might be care for the heart and soul that we loved. Because the struggles do come. And it's that way when somebody receives grace from God, his heart is filled with joy. But pretty soon, there come doubts and fears, trials, tribulations, and unbelief even might be loved. And that is when we need to, as God's children, carefully care one for another. May it be that in your midst, beloved, I know that uh, you are most, most of you are young, you're struggling with your families, but may there be care one, one for another. And may it be, beloved, in this care that we have one for another, that we can see the end of the journey. And sometimes when trials and tribulations are heavy upon our heart, it seems we can't go on another step. How good it is to go and speak to somebody. And when we speak to them, what usually happens, and I've had this happen in my life again and again and again, when I go to speak to somebody, then when they open their heart, then my heart is opened also. And those are the precious moments when we share our weary hearts together and the sweet knowledge of Jesus who has redeemed us. May this blessing be upon you, my beloved. Paul 
then makes known to Timothy, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. So Paul then speaks of Timothy's mother and grandmother. And beloved, most of us in our experience, we also have memories of mothers and grandmothers and how precious it has been to have, have that memory. Uh, my own uh, mother was only 51 years old when she died, and uh, it's uh, almost 50 years ago, or more than 50 years ago when she died. Uh, I have a beautiful memory of my mother. I remember once when my, my young heart was smitten, and I'd gone out behind the woodshed to cry. My mother came seeking me to fight me. And oh, beloved, this matter of Christianity is such that it has always come on feet. It has come on feet. And for each one of us, there has been somebody who has sought us and nurtured us and cared for us. And as we look upon these uh, old uh, mothers and grandmothers, you know, many of them, they did not have a vast knowledge of the scriptures. Uh, some of them could hardly read even. But in their hearts, they had living faith. And when they spoke of Christianity, they spoke from the heart. There can be those who have uh, gifts, uh, gifts to speak and gifts of language. Some people have tongues of gold. Some people know scripture forward and backward. There are many, many people who know the scripture far, far better than I ever will know it. And there are people then with these gifts, uh, they know not only the English language, but they may know the original languages of the Bible. And they can refer to the Greek and the Hebrew. They love all these things can be, and still it can be, that the word of God is not rightly divided. And it's from sometimes just a few simple words spoken from the heart that open the heart to the knowledge of grace. And as Paul writes here further on, wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So God's work then when it goes forth, it goes forth, as he says here, by the putting on of my hands uh, and the laying on of hands, as Paul speaks of it here, is not just in the declaration of the forgiveness of sins, but it was used otherwise also in the New Testament time. And when I speak of this, then it brings to my remembrance something uh, that occurred at a, one of the conventions. It was in Newburgh some years back. My wife and I usually go to the Finnish, Finnish services. And at the Finnish service, there were two, two preachers who spoke. And both of them asked forgiveness. And they were, Forgiveness was proclaimed, proclaimed from the from the congregation. But in the afternoon service, then uh, somebody got up and they said, "You know, this morning I was really troubled because forgiveness was proclaimed, but there was no laying on of hands." And the person who said this, he said that I was troubled, but I did not go up to to. Pro put my hands upon, upon them either. So he asked forgiveness. And then the fire of God started to burn. There were countless then who had to ask forgiveness and to be freed from their neglect in that matter and many, many other matters. The matter of laying on of hands, I don't say it has to be even in the proclamation of the forgiveness, but it's just so precious, my beloved, when your heart is troubled when somebody embraces you and places their hand upon you and make known unto you that God is gracious and merciful to you and he does forgive you your sins and your trespasses. 
Beloved, may God's word, living and alive, go forth in our midst. May it be that those things which sometimes, even in our midst, people speak of as traditions. And there's one thing about the traditions of our Lestadian movement. Every single one of those things that people call traditions, they have an ethical foundation in God's word. And oh, how I pray for our times, my beloved, and in these last days, that God will grant unto us that the living power of God's word will go forth. And as Paul here says, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And Paul makes a remarkable statement in 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter and the 20th verse. He says, the kingdom of God is not in word, but it is in power. And when Paul writes this way, he's not saying that the word of God is not the power of God, but he is saying that words or speaking avail nothing unless the power of God is there. And this power of God and my beloved, it pierces the heart. It brings man to the place where man is a beggar and in need of his grace. May God grant for you, my beloved, that the power of God will rest upon you, and that God's word, quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, that it will pierce into your hearts and into your souls, so that we can experience like Mary, the mother of Jesus, when the Christ child was brought to the temple and Mary was there for, because the days of her purification were accomplished, and the aged Simeon took that Christ child into his arms and said, Now let thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen the salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. And then Simeon turned to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and told her that a sword would pierce through her soul also. Beloved, one day, Mary, who brought Christ into this world as far as he was the Son of Man, she stood at the foot of the cross, and there at the cross, Mary came to know her son as her redeemer and savior. And for you who are young, beloved, you have been brought up in Christianity, which is precious. And maybe you have strived in all the days of your life to abide in that. But the time will come for you also when your heart will be pierced through with a sword. You know, then when that time comes, Christianity is not grievous nor hard to bear. The counsel and the teaching of God's word are not a heavy burden upon your heart, but they are a joy, a joy and a blessedness, because your very heart and soul, your whole being, has become a partaker of Christ and him crucified, and he who has provided salvation full and free. Paul can witness this morning, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. And this is the promise of God's word to each one of us. When we are a partaker of his grace, we are also partakers of the afflictions of the gospel. This is according to the power of God. And as Paul then declares unto us, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So, beloved, as we face this moment of grace, that which our Savior has prepared for you and for me, this grace full and free, and the blood of Christ which washes away our sins and our trespasses. Always remember that the blood of Christ is twofold. First of all, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Christ had to suffer and die, my beloved, to satisfy the righteousness of God. He had to shed his blood for the remission of our sins, the forgiveness of our sins. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. We follow the Savior and his footsteps, my beloved. We go with him 
to the Garden of Gethsemane. And the scripture tells us that as he fell on his face upon the ground, his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood. Beloved, our Savior at this moment in Gethsemane fell upon him all the woes of mankind, from the first sin committed in the Garden of Eden to the last sin that will be committed upon the face of this earth. But not only sins, my beloved, but every sorrow, every tribulation, every trial that has assailed man, suddenly it descended upon the Lamb of God, the innocent, the pure, the holy. And how could it be otherwise but great sweat came forth from his pores? And when he redeemed us, my beloved, he took upon himself every one of our sins and our trespasses. He knew us from the foundation of the world. When he suffered on the cross and in the garden, our sins weighed upon him. And for each one of our sins, my beloved, woe and tribulation and pain came upon the Lamb of God. And when it is this way, then, my beloved, is it any wonder why he will not let us go? He has paid the price for each one of our sins. And I know for my own part, the burdens that have sometimes been upon my heart, how heavy they have been. And if your conscience has ever been burdened with sin and sin has pressed upon your conscience, you know the agony of it. But the agony of every sin fell upon Christ. That's the kind of a redeemer we have. When he went to the place of sacrifice of Mount Golgotha, and there, suspended between heaven and earth, between the fire of God's wrath and the fire of his love, he prepared salvation for, for you and for me. When he cried from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He saw you and me. When on the cross he cried, I thirst. And because Christ was both man and God, as a man, he naturally thirsted. But as the Son of God, his thirst was for you and for me. And never is that thirst quenched until we are his. Only then, my beloved, when we belong to him, is his thirst satisfied. And even this morning of grace, he thirsts for each one of us. He wants us. Yes, he wants us and he desires us. And he desires us far more than we desire and want him. When he cried from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Beloved, you know what it is to be forsaken. The scripture tells us his disciples all forsook him. But then God also forsook him. And there alone, alone our Savior and Redeemer paid the price for our sins, satisfied the righteousness of God. And I do believe in the book of Revelations when it says there was silence in heaven for a half hour. When the darkness of night descended upon the earth at noonday, when our Savior suffered on Golgotha, even heaven was silent. Not one answer, my beloved. And why? So that you and I could be his redeemed children, partakers of his grace. Beloved, this is the shedding of blood. And from his streams, streams of blood from Emmanuel's veins, that crimson stream, Yes, Golgotha's bleeding red river yet flows. And all sinners must step into that stream and become partakers of that blood. And we become partakers of that blood because not only is there the shed blood, but there is also the sprinkling blood. And God be thanked that the sprinkling blood of Jesus that speaks better things than the blood of Abel can be upon your heart and upon my heart. And as we thank God for this great grace, then we can say with Paul, who have Christ Jesus, who have abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So our Savior, suffering and dying upon the cross of Golgotha, he also has arisen from the tomb. He sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And even this morning, he looks down from heaven. He sees us. He knows us, my beloved. And he intercedes for the Father in our behalf. And how beautiful is going to, going to be that day, my beloved, 
when time is no more, and when we reach the beauties of heaven, you know, Christ is going to embrace us and he's going to say to the Father, these are my children, I have redeemed them. They have been with me and yet so many oh God, I have come to know them. And we are acceptable unto the Father through the merits of his dear son, the bleeding, bloody merits of the crucified Savior and Redeemer. Paul says, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So Paul then, speaking as a preacher, an apostle, a teacher, he says, I know in whom I have believed. And beloved, for my heart this morning of grace, I thank God I know in whom I have believed. I thank God that my heart has been a partaker of God's great grace and mercy. I often heard the old Christians say, the older they are, the poorer they become. I often wondered, how could that be? But now as time has gone on, I know it's true. The older you are, the poorer you become. And I know how it is for the young. You feel, well, someday I'll be old and it'll be easy, my journey of Christianity. And it's true that we all have those things that assail us. The young have the things that assail them, but the old also have the things that assail their heart. Oh, may God graciously grant for your heart and for my heart that we can re remain steadfast unto the end, that not only will we be partakers of his grace now, but we can be partakers of paradise forever and forever. And in conclusion, then this morning, hold fast the form of sound word which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Hold fast to the form of sound words which thou hast heard. Beloved, if there is ever a time when we have need to hold fast to the sound words, not only of the scripture, but also from our time of visitation. I myself, uh, beloved, uh, I have read uh, very, very much uh, the writings of our time of visitation. I have sometimes heard it said, we don't need to have those those writings. I, from my heart, I'm so exceedingly thankful for them that I can't tell you. It was through the writings of Listadius that I came to know the work of the devil of self-righteousness. I remember the struggle of my heart, and oh, when I read Listadius, how the devil of self-righteousness is that kind of an accuser, that first of all, he tells man, you know, that this is a little sin. It's all right to do it. Then after you have committed it, then he tells you it's such a big sin, it cannot be forgiven. And we, in this journey, in this wilderness journey, we are beset on every side. Sin surrounds us in the world today, and sin as it has always been in the world, but maybe never as openly as it is today in the world. And I know that you who are parents and have your children, young children, that many times your heart is filled with fear that the world is such that can my children possibly survive? And can it be possible that they will be God's children? And it's true that sin rages, but you know the foundation of all sin, my beloved, is in the heart of man. Sometimes the question is asked, what is sin? I've had it asked me countless times. Sometimes people feel that the only sin that there are are the ones that are definitely named in the scripture. And beloved, if it was that way, I don't know how big the Bible would be if it had to name all the sins. It's not that way in the scripture. I'm thankful that it's not that way. Because if it was that way, then we could follow the pattern and we could feel everything is all right. As a matter of fact, for some churches in the world today, they're called holiness churches. And we have been well acquainted with uh, some of the holiness people. Their church has a manual of conduct. It tells exactly 
what things you cannot do to be a member, a member of their church, exactly everything in your life, exactly how it is. But beloved, you know, where sin dwells is in our members. And the Apostle Paul then writes about the law of sin that is in my members. It is when we come to know our inborn corruption that we come to know what sin is. Then I'm going to make some bold statements this morning, beloved. And if you do not agree with me, well, please talk to me about it. But, you know, anything, the very best thing in life can become a sin when it's united with our fallen nature. The very best thing in life, my beloved, because the foundation of all sin is within us, in our fallen nature. And when I say this, beloved, I know it covers a broad, broad thing. But that's how near sin is, my beloved, and how carefully we must journey and walk here in life. Because when we have come to know our own poorness, our own poverty, we know how easily we are lured into sin, how easily we can fall into sin. Then, beloved, sin becomes exceeding sinful. And that was the experience of the Apostle Paul. He says, I was without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Paul, my beloved, who knew the law backwards and forwards, he said, I was once without the law. He knew the law outwardly. But when he came to know his own inborn corruption and the law of sin which was in his members, then it was something different. Beloved, when we face the world today, you know the reason, beloved, why there is adultery and fornication and all those things that we call great sins, the reason is because people expose themselves to those things that arouse lust. It's just that simple. And if you have come to know yourself and your own heart, you know it's that way. And that's why then we can preach that tele about television that we do. I've heard people say that, well, television isn't mentioned in the Bible. How can it be sin? But when you have come to know the law of sin in yourself, then you know that you cannot expose yourself to it because you know what it will do to you. And it is true then with all the things that surround us and then be loved because of what the word of God is telling us here to hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Those things that have been taught as sin in our Lestadian Christianity, beloved, there was a foundation in God's word for all of them. Our outward appear, appearance, our apparel, our walk of life, every single one of them has an ethical foundation in God's word. And we come to know that, my beloved, when we come to know the law of sin that is in our memories. And as I speak of this, this grace given morning, beloved, I, together with you, have to war and fight against sin daily. And the warfare and the strife does not end, my beloved, until we are laid into the grave. But in this warfare then with sin, and with sin that is within our members, then, beloved, we need the word of God. We need the Savior and the Redeemer. And, beloved, we need the power of God in our life and in our journey. May God abundantly grant for your heart and for my heart the sweet blessedness of being God's child, and that as we journey onward in our pilgrimage, and as we hasten towards our homeland in heaven above, when sin besets your heart, beloved, and when your conscience is smitten with sin, then do take care of your conscience. To have a good conscience is most precious. And there's one thing about it. If we do not keep a good conscience, it will rob us of faith. There have been countless uh, children and young people who have been brought up in our church uh, who have had the experience of sin coming into their life and journey and pretty soon the burden becomes so heavy they could no longer believe. But then the sad thing is, beloved, that many of them have never, never returned. Even today, on the vast seas of this life, there are children from Christian homes who are being tossed about and living in sin and being carried in the swift stream of time 
to an endless eternity of damnation and destruction. Oh, may God grant, my beloved, for your heart and my heart, that we can behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and that we can press our hearts into the living knowledge of him. And as we journey here, that we walk in carefulness of life and take care of our heart and our conscience. May God grant that for you and for me. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.